Okay, everybody, let's get started. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Chad with Turner's Warehouse. Today we're gonna be finishing that pen we've been working on the last two weeks. And just because this is the end of this pen, uh, we're still continuing the custom pen stuff. Next week, I believe the plan is either to do a clip or make a rollerball section. I don't remember which one's first, but we're gonna do at least those two. We're gonna do put a clip on a pen so you can see how to do that. We're not actually gonna make the clip, I don't think, this time, just because of time constraints. Hey, you wanna go close the big door? Um, we're gonna close the big door out here. There's a bunch of truck noise. But we're gonna do a clip addition to a cap, and then we're also gonna make a rollerball section, because not everybody wants fountain. So you can make rollerball or fountain or have them be interchangeable. So we'll go through that. But let's jump into this today. As always, uh, Amy's moderating on the computer, so she'll answer any questions she can right away, and then if not, she'll ask me. Feel free to shout out any questions, because I love getting questions, because a lot of times I'll just be working away and I'll forget to mention something. So if you think of a question, no problem. Uh, most of this stuff, I think, is on our homepage um, to Turner's Warehouse, so the tooling. If not, we can shoot you a link to the tooling. But pretty much everything we use, we carry here. So if you're wanting to get started on this and you have questions, just reach out to us. No problem at all. This is a, this series has been just the basics of making a custom pen. And there's a lot of possibilities that you can do on this. So, so if you're going to get started on this, just have fun and play with it and tweak it. And you'll see there's really endless options. All right, we'll get going here. Let's jump to camera three. Okay, so what I've got is, I've got my three parts here, cap body section. What I'm gonna be using today, uh, I'm still gonna be using my collet chuck with all the different collets. Actually, I only need a couple. Uh, I'm gonna be using my mandrels. Now these are homemade mandrels that I've been using. They're made of aluminum. You can make them out of anything. There's brass. This is a Beaufort mandrel, which we do offer in the store. Um, but you can make them out of brass, Durlin, whatever you want. I don't think I'd recommend aluminum. I seem to bend these pretty easily, so I probably won't make more out of aluminum. But the problem is I have all my ones over the years that I made out of aluminum. Uh, but making a mandrel can be a little intimidating, so I think we're actually going to even do a video on that and how you would make a mandrel, because it's not that hard. And if you have the taps and dies to do this stuff on the caps and bodies and whatever, you can actually make your mandrel pretty easy. So we'll, we'll look into that. But other than the collet chuck, the only other stuff we're gonna use today are our turning tools. I'm gonna go ahead and use carbide for these. And then we're gonna do our polishing with uh, wet dry sandpaper and zona paper. So if you're not familiar with those, we're gonna go over those. And then after we get it all polished, we'll assemble it. And I'll show you a couple little tricks uh, I like to do to, to keep it smooth and uh, working well. So we will have tips right up to the end of this. So don't, don't turn away early on this one because you're going to want to see the end. But <clears throat> to get started, we're going to do the cap first. Now I kind of have a little, um, a little way I do it. I do the cap, then the body, then the section. And I'll show you why here in a minute. But for these mandrels, your part will just thread on. And then you'll need the appropriate size collet. And these two, I think, are the same. These are the half inch. So your body will thread on, your section will thread on, and your cap will thread on. Now, when you do a section, and we'll go into this a little more when we do it, there's two types of mandrels for this. You can do a mandrel that mimics the the nib and goes inside like that. And this is the way I prefer it. Or you can do the reverse where your tenon threads into a mandrel that you put in and then you use a live center. Now I don't like this personally because I snap a lot of tenons off right here at the threads because all the pressure is on those threads versus the other way, even though these are fine little threads, I feel like it holds a little better and I can get that front up to the shoulder and it seems to be stronger. Now, don't get me wrong. I can break a section using either mandrel. I'm very good at it, 
but I find I do far better with this type. So just like we were reverse drilling into the section for those different steps of the nib section, that's kind of what we've recreated on the mandrel and it works really well. So that's the one we're gonna be using right there. And we'll get back to that one here shortly. But let's jump over to the lathe. We're gonna put this one on and uh, do the cap. Ooh, that looks blurry. Is that camera or is that the internet blurry? Okay. So if you were watching last week, we had some technical difficulties. We think we're all good now, so hopefully. All right, real quick reminder, if you are using a collet chuck, snap your collet into the nut first. It shouldn't fall out. You don't wanna just put the collet in and put the nut on. It will not seat correctly. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and show you here. So we're gonna feed this in and tighten this up. What? Yeah, some, something happened, it got blurry, but I think we're okay. All right, so I'm gonna tighten this up quite a lot. I think I'm like in between a collet size that I don't have. But as long as I tighten it, it seems to work. All right, where are you? Okay. Now, if you remember last time or the time before, I always did that little um, countersink on the end of each blank. And this is where that's gonna kind of pay off for us because we're gonna use our live center. And we're gonna put it on the end here and this is a, for support. Now, one thing I didn't just mention, I had it marked last time, is I need to know where the end of my hole is on this. So what I'm gonna do, here I'll just take a Sharpie and I'm just gonna kinda get a ballpark. I mean, it doesn't have to be exact but I don't wanna cut my hole. And what I mean by that is if I'm cutting off my blank and you know, giving a little taper or shape, if I cut across that end of that hole and I go too far, I'll cut my part off. And we actually had a, a friend bring one in the other day as a sample, I meant to show it and I forgot. Um, but literally the end of his pen cap just turned off because it was so thin there, he hit the hole. So I'm gonna use that line to kind of give me a eyeball on where I can taper this in. Oops. So let's put this back on. We're gonna feed it on. And we want it tight up against the mandrel here, snug, because we don't wanna give this blank, this cap anywhere to spin that doesn't match our, our uh, mandrel. If we're turning and the lathe is running and our cap starts spinning or tightening and we have any kind of a catch, it'll likely spin those threads and it'll rip the threads out. So that's what you're kind of in danger for here. It's not that big a deal on a cap and body because you have a lot of meat and a lot of threads, but on the section, it's far more I don't know, likely to happen because the threads are just so, so small and so fine that if you catch it, you can just rip it out. So hopefully that doesn't happen. Now, today I'm gonna to use two carbide tools primarily. Uh, I'm using a square negative rake radius. Uh, not that this material is particularly hard or difficult, but I don't wanna risk a catch. So the negative rake works really nice. And I'm using a negative rake uh, detail tool, the diamond point detail tool. And I'm going to actually use that for my cutoff. So you're going to see here in just a second. So let's get started. And I think you guys can let me know. I'm going to turn my cam back on for uh, dust collection here. If it's crazy loud, we can always shut it off, but oh boy, let's give it a try. So we'll go over. How's that for sound? Can you guys still hear me okay? So any of the uh, 
turning stuff for this, the taps dies, everything is on order. Um, so it's all within two or three weeks of getting here and we'll list it as we get them. So just put your name in the back in stock and then you'll, you'll get notified. How's the sound on that, okay? Okay, so, well, that's good. Amy says she can't hear the cam vac, so I've got air running that way, so that'll be good. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do two things here, and you can turn this however you want. Everybody watching this probably knows how to turn, so you can turn this however you want. First thing I'm gonna do is just make it round, because even though this is a round blank, we didn't do anything to round it beforehand, so we're probably not really round. These are cast in PVC, which is not round. Yeah. So we'll just get it pretty much round. Definitely not round. And I'm gonna kind of skip my line there. And you wanna watch your tailstock because what happens is you're putting a point into fairly soft resin comparatively to that metal point. And it'll build up some heat and it'll, it'll get some space in there, a gap from the spinning and the heat. So what I'm gonna do, I've got this pretty close and you can see, there's my line. I know that I want my cap to end somewhere out here. All right, there's a nice little curly. So I'm gonna use this point tool, this diamond tool, and I'm gonna make a separation here. And essentially I'm gonna shape the top of the cap as well as, why do I feel like this tool rest is low? I'm gonna shape the top of the cap and I'm gonna create some space. Now I will warn you for everyone that's new to this, one thing, when you are separating your cap from the, the waste material on the end, it's super important that you don't, if, if you're using a parting tool or like a tool like this or a saw, do not run the lathe because if you are cutting that with whatever and your end piece and your cap piece are there and it's just got that little bit and anything moves like the, the waste material comes down or up, whatever, and it binds into your tool, into your cap, you'll generally crack the cap off or crack the threads and be wasted. So the reason I'm cutting a lot of space on this right here is I'm giving myself room so if I have any kind of weirdness with my tool, I can still survive. And this is just one way to do it. There's a million ways to cut a cap off. Do it however you want. They all probably work just fine. But this way I can kind of shape my cap as I cut in. So I'm pushing into the cap where I want my shape to be and then I'm pushing away from the cap to create that space. Once I'm comfortable that I can see my my depression here, which I'm very good here. I can now shape this cap down. And I know where I am here because of the thickness of my mandrel and the thickness of my blank, but I don't need this black line anymore. So I can cut that off and I can kind of taper this down. And you don't have to use carbide tools for this. You can use whatever you want. For me, pen making in general, carbide works really well. And I especially like this negative rake on something that's a little more fragile. All right. Now this is a relatively large pen. It's an M14 that we did. So this is gonna be a pretty big boy either way. So I kinda of wanna take as much down as I can without you know, risking it, so to speak.
And I want to make nice passes, especially at the end, because anything I can do to save myself sanding will be nice. All right. Now, keep in mind, you can measure this, you can take it off and test fit it, whatever you want to do. If I was trying to make the same model over and over, I would certainly have measurements. This is a one-off for the video, so I'm not too worried about it. So we're just going to get a good shape here, something we like. I should ask Amy because she'll probably steal this pen after anyway. No? trying to get a response <laughs> just kidding Amy all right I'll give it a little more shape here actually you're waiting for the clip one right okay so I'm pretty good with this shape let's see how this resin looks oh cool you can see I've got a lot of lines on there from my turning let's try to take some of those off it feels like or it looks like I have a chip in my tool Uh, the question was, do I find that the square radius cutter gives better control? Yeah. Is that right? Yes. So, and, but I'll tell you in general, I use the square radius, not necessarily the negative rake, but I use the square radius for like 90% of everything pen related because you can shape it. You can give it these like gentle curves, super, super easy. So I really like it for that. So yes, the answer is absolutely. Now, what I'm doing is I'm getting a little deeper on my cut here, on this part here. Now, I don't want to risk going too thin, but I need it thin enough that I can separate this. So you see, every time I make the cut, I'm kind of pushing outward back here. Now, let's see, is that small enough? These things are so fine. Okay, that's good. So what you'll see here is I've got this little tiny thin top and I'm just gonna, if it's thin enough, eh, we better go a little thinner. I wanna snap it off of there, but I want it to snap pretty easily. I don't want it to snap uh, or be real difficult. So I'm not trying to cut through with my tool. I'm just trying to get it thin. And then, there we go, a little snap. Okay. And let me move this. You can see here that it leaves this nice little nubbin. And the reason this is better, in my opinion, is if we had just put our live center into the pen, we end up with a hole in our pen that's really hard to get out because it's going to be fairly deep but I can come in here now and just gently clean up this nub and give it any shape that I want without having that hole so you can make this flat curve square triangle whatever you want and that's good to go so this cap is now ready for polishing. And man, I got a lot of scratches in there. I'm gonna have to look at my, my cutter. Cause I can be rough, but that's a lot of scratches. But we're gonna be able to get those out no problem. All right. Now you could go through and do each one, turn each one, come back and do all the wet work. But I'm just gonna go ahead and sand and polish while we're doing this. I'm using four, I'm sorry, 600, 800 sandpaper. Here, I got some cut. And then I'm gonna use Zona paper. So 
It's a fairly straightforward process. We're going to see in the end, I'm going to try to keep this little bit of a square edge versus super rounded. So this won't take much. Now I wet sand everything um, for two reasons. And you hear that maybe you hear the cam vac is off. Um, but wet sanding keeps all the dust in the water instead of in the air, which that alone is enough reason. But I also think it makes them shinier. I like the way wet sanded stuff looks. So I wet sand everything pretty much. And you can see with this 600, we're going pretty quick here, but we should have all of those scratches out just that fast. Let me get my glasses on. I got to remember not to stick my head in the... Yeah, looks pretty good, huh? All right, I think I, I think I got them all. I don't see any radial scratches. Okay, that's going to be a nice looking pen, isn't it? Now, I'm going to use Zona paper. If you're not familiar with Zona paper, it's a polishing soft cloth paper. Uh, it's like micro mesh, except there's only six grits versus nine. And it comes in a eight and a half by 11 sheet versus the little pads. Now, I like this stuff. I'll use it for four or five pens. I usually cut them about this size and then I just work through the, the sheets. So uh, you can use whatever you want to polish if you're using magic juice or micro mesh or whatever. We're gonna use Zona with a little bit of polish at the end and it'll really come out nice. So we'll just kind of hit the end here. And we'll move through it. So this is gonna be, we're gonna spend a little time on each one here sanding and polishing. So if you guys have questions on anything, this is a great time to do it. But we'll move through this as quick as we can and still give you all the info. Uh, so the question was, you can have a hole in the end if you're going to add a clip. Um, yes, but I mean, I wouldn't drill a hole just for that because you're going to want to have it size for the tap and die you're using, which we will go over in the next one. But essentially, you're going to create another tenon and another hole that's threaded and, and threaded in there. So yes, but you got to do it for the right reasons, if that makes sense. Is that what you meant, CJ? Hopefully. If anyone is wondering, this is our molten metal um, top choice blank. And this one I set aside because it kind of was a weird pour, like half of it was not super thick and it still looks awesome. But I always wanted to make a pen out of it for myself. So this was a good chance to use it. But the molten metal looks really cool. Whoa, good flip. And I'll move through these pretty quick. You can, um, if you have the time, always spend more time on this because the more polishing you do, the better it looks generally, unless you're not going for a polished look. So right now I'm going 950. I would prefer it to be seven to 900. The question was, how fast is the lathe going? Um, Seven to nine is pretty sweet. If you go much faster, it's real easy to get radial marks. So you can do it, but just be aware. You got to really keep your movement going. Let's see here. Try to keep this so you guys can see. But generally sanding any resin, seven to 900, wet with your movement going like this is pretty good. And you're going to see here pretty quick, this is going to look pretty shiny. And like I said, there's a reason we're doing the cap, then the body, then the section, and it all kind of makes sense here as we go. Uh, 
Uh, when would you add it? Is that the question? Yeah, how do you add it? When do you add it? Oh, okay. So the question is, if you add, want to add a roll stop, when or how would you add that? Uh, roll stop's pretty simple item. Um, it essentially is just anything that you add to the cap that keeps it from rolling because it makes it not round. So uh, what were Zach and I looking at? Zach and I, Zach Higgins and I were talking about cool stuff that make, would make good roll stops. Maybe it was like earrings or something, but essentially whatever it is, like earrings would be good because there's a shank on them. So anything with a shaft that you can put in, uh, you would just drill a hole. If it's th a threaded device, that'd be even better, but uh, you just drill a hole and put it in with some epoxy. I would do it probably after, I might drill the hole before I polished but then I would probably put it in after and I'd be super careful not to get any glue on anything. Maybe put the glue in the hole rather than on the, the part going in. Um, but that's when I would do it. I've actually not done a ton of roll stops. I've done one, I got one right here that I've done, I'll show you. This is a kind of an elaborate pen. Oh, we're not overhead. This is a, uh, I cast this in bronze, the honeycomb, filled it with crushed malachite. It's a green resin I poured, malachite on the ends, and then I cast this out of bronze. It's a B to go with the honeycomb, and it's a roll stop, so it just won't roll off the table. But you can use anything. This is a little large in my opinion, but it works well, and it looks kind of cool. Uh, but you can use anything for a roll stop. A snake ring. I actually have like 10 of those snake rings laying on my uh, workbench that I always wanted to make them for a roll stop and I never have done it yet. But yeah, that's a great choice. I think it would look cool too. If you got like a snake kind of pattern resin, that would be really cool. All right. I know this is boring guys, but hang in with me. It's going to be, we'll get there. Yeah, what else have you guys used for roll stops? Have any, has anybody come up with anything cool? All right, this is looking super shiny and I can tell even through the wet. All right, take a look at this. Look at that thing. All right. <clears throat> so I'm just gonna give this a tiny little wipe here. Um, just to get the water off. I'm not gonna like rub it down too much, but I'm gonna put this on. This is ring bling. Uh, same as any kind of, it's the like number six on the, the magic juice or um, like Plastex pl polish, which we also have at the store uh, for cars, works great on resins. But you wanna just put it on and work it across. If you need a little more, go for it. I'm not putting much on at a time though, but I'm just kind of moving it around the, the, the towel here. I don't want to hit the towel with too much dry work because it'll, it could scratch it up. All right, let's see. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Mosaic pins would look super cool. I don't know, can you see that on the screen? That looks awesome. See, I knew this would be a good pen. If this cap is anything to do, hopefully the light's not blowing it out. It's got like a weird tiger pattern, but it's kind of flat on one side. That's why I thought it was unique. But yeah, all right. So there's our cap. Uh, we're ready to go. We're gonna just swap out and do the exact same thing on the body here. Those two are pretty straightforward. The section's a little different. All right. So, loosen this up. Yeah, that was a, that was a good idea. Mosaic pins, because I, I like the look of those anyway for knives and stuff. But yeah, that would be really cool. Or even, even a brass screw would look good because it would look like an accent. Tighten this thing.
Come on. There we go. These things can be quite robust. So I'm going to swap out the collet. So my, my sizing on my mandrels isn't real standard because I use the metal lathe a lot and I just am using a regular chuck. So I didn't have to fit any particular collets, but it is nice to have them sized correctly. Like this is a half inch, it fits really well. The other one is kind of an oddball size. I don't even know if it is a size. Okay, so I'm gonna put this back up here. Put our tool in and uh, right there. That one does not have much of an imprint. Oh, one thing I did not do is mark this one. So I'm gonna take this off and I'm just gonna get my depth marked on here like I just had it. Let's see. All right. And I've got a lot of, a lot of length on this one. So do you think I should make this a long body or a shorter body? So there's the cap. And that's the, the whole length. Should I make it shorter or keep it a little longer? Oh, medium, that's a good idea. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll just see where, it, where I decide to cut into it when I get there. All right, so get that up there. Oh, a pin. Yeah, pins would be good. Um, as long as they're not too big, although you can curve pins, pins would be really cool, actually. You should do that one, Scott. That'd be great. If you guys think of cool stuff and you do it, you got you to gotta let us know. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing here. I'm going to round this. And it, I can see it wobbling, so it is definitely not round. Well, I kind of cut my line there a little bit. See how it's just chipping? It's not cutting ribbons. It is certainly at a round. I guess it doesn't really matter as long as you get it shaped, but You may as well round it up. <clears throat> okay, so there's our line. Let's go right here. So I'm gonna cut in and out. So I'm gonna cut in and out. I'm pushing in at an angle and then I'm cutting across. Oh, let me hit that vacuum. The vac really is nice for the dust because a lot of these Resin blanks are really dusty when you're cutting them. And it does suck up the chips sometimes, but mostly the dust is what's important. Okay. I think I'm pretty good there on my spacing. I'm not gonna mistake that for anything, but now I got a lot of material to take off. so. You can see on the step here where my threads are. I want my body, I like the body to be a little undersized from the cap. So generally the cap will have just a little bit of a proudness to it over the body. You can make it all the same size. You can actually thread them together and turn them all at once, but uh, for some reason I don't like doing that. <laughs> so I got a lot of material to take off. I'm gonna. I'm going to have a slight taper from the center where the threads are down to the end, but not much, just a little. So let's do it.
Yes, absolutely. The question is, is there a trick to getting the grain to line up from the cap to the body? Hold on one second, I'll kind of explain that. I am way out of whack here. There we go, a little better. I feel like my, my lathe head might be a little crooked and I forgot to check it earlier. It's really screaming. I mean, this is a huge pen still. It seems to scream right there. some of this off of here see how much I'm trying not to hit the mic see how much closer we are here because we had this much size you can really see the difference in how much we've taken away from it because that's still full size Take that body down a little bit. Yeah, see I'm getting really close to my depth and I, I felt like I had a huge step there. why it's chattering like that it seems to it seems to only chatter one direction all right so that looks pretty good let's go ahead and separate this now there again if you're not sure of how this is going to look with the cap you can take it off and test it you can measure it you can do whatever um, i'm not worried about it so i'm going to go ahead and do my end more here I'm just going in and across. Get all that out of there. It's hard to get those shavings out of there. All right. Okay, I think we're I think we're narrow enough. All right. Turn that off. So the question was is there a way to get your cap and body to line up? Um, when you're doing this, absolutely. I'll admit I'm not the best at that because I don't do it a lot because a lot of the stuff I do is like random pattern plastic or um, like two-tone. Like there is no, on something like this where there's a pattern in the body and then a pattern in the top, there is nothing to line up. But it's essentially how far your threads go on or off and where they start. Now, the, the thing to remember, if your threads line up in one spot, 
These are triple start threads, meaning three places they can begin. So they're only gonna line up in one of three spots. So if it lines up, you could line it up, but then the next time you put it on, it might not, to, might not line up and you'd have to back it up till it clicks, try the next one, back it up till it clicks, try the next one. So that's a negative of triple start. However, the ease of them going on and off like that so nicely are, it's probably worth it. But essentially, if it didn't line up, if you put your cap on and it didn't line up, you could increase or shorten your threads until it rotates far enough to line up, if that makes sense. So it's a matter of where you stop essentially threading, either in the cap or in the body, and if it stops in that place. So good question. Real good. Um, how oh. would you have... Those are different types, so you don't want to mix them. Somebody wants to... Uh, like the cap and body. So the question is, how do you make the cap and body match? Um, you could, if you're turning it like this one at a time, you would just measure with your calipers and, and turn it till it matches. Or you could thread it together while you still have your ends on, hold one end in your collet and one end on your tailstock and turn the whole body together. And that's just a preference thing. I always find those kind of weird when they are perfectly flat, although I just made a couple and they look great. Um, but I like the proud cap, so that's why I do it this way. But yeah, if you want them to match up, that's no big deal. You can do it that way or just by measuring. Absolutely. All right, great questions, everybody. Sounds like, sounds like some cool stuff is going to be made. So I'm going to turn this up now. I've got a long body here, so I'm going to kind of hold this just for support. I'm not pushing on it or anything. I'm just not letting it move freely. And I'll give this kind of just a little taper. And there again, I can get rid of that end and not have a hole in the end by doing that. Now I could always, this would be a good spot if I wanted to test fit my cap and see if we're close to what we like. But Judging by how this looks, I think it's gonna be pretty awesome. And I think we got a pretty cool pattern in it. Now I went a little deeper, so my flat spot is kind of gone on this one. But we're gonna we're gonna turn this the same way here. Let me get some paper. All right, let's show it overhead. So same process, we're gonna sand it. Once all of our turning marks are out, we will polish with Zona paper or whatever you polish with. I'm using Zona paper, but you can use whatever. And see, that gives us a nice clean end right there. That sandpaper really finishes it off. Now I am going to be careful not to go off the body and hit my threads because I don't want to sand them down, at least not at this point. I'm just using my finger to kind of feel if there's any imperfections or weirdness. Is anybody planning on doing this that hasn't done it yet? I mean, I'm hoping if you're watching this, that's kind of the plan, right? And you can see all that slurry coming off of there. That's all the, the resin slurry that would be up in the air. So if you're not a fan of wet sanding for any other reason, it's worth it for the dust. All right, let's take a look at this. So a, a mosaic pin, I don't know if it, will be easy to see these, but what a mosaic pin is, is it's essentially a tube of varying sizes. And for knife making, they come in from this little tiny size on the way up to like half inch. But it's a tube with other tubes or pins or squares um, inside. And like we carry a bunch of these for knife making, probably 10 different types. And they all have unique little patterns. You can also make your own 
uh, by getting tubes and rods and whatever and putting them in and then you fill it with epoxy. So once you've got all that metal stuff in there, you squeeze epoxy through it and it makes it solid. And the cool thing about the epoxy, if you're doing it yourself, is you can change the color. So you could match the color. So uh, for this to be a roll stop, you'd have to probably drill the size of the pin hole into the cap and then set it in a little bit and that would probably work pretty well. Maybe round the edges so it's not like a sharp metal edge and just have a smooth finish. Who? Zach. Hey, Zach. Thanks for joining us. All right, <clears throat> so back to it. Let's, let's get this uh, polished. We did the sanding. Now we'll do the zona. Obviously, I've got some, some shavings flying around and landing in my water. Not ideal. I, you know, if I was working normally, I probably would have blown the lathe off with the, the air blower, but I don't want to create a dust cloud in here for the cameras. So, you know, take care and clean it up before you do this, because obviously this in the water is not great. If Zach's watching, it probably drives him crazy. Zach's very clean from what I can tell. But we're just going to get this sucker polished up, looking nice. And with, if you haven't used Zona before, like I said, four or five pens uh, or parts, whatever. And uh, you want to use it like 30 to 45 seconds per grit. And I would say at a minimum, if you've got time to do a couple minutes on each one, man, you're just going to get a better finish. And this stuff to me is hard to beat for finish. So most of the stuff that I make or display in our store is all Zona paper. All of our rings are Zona polished. So I can't say enough good about it. I was actually really reluctant to use it. And John David Jones, one time I was with him somewhere and we were making something. And he said, you gotta try this Zona. And I was like, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> But then I tried it and I've been using it ever since. But I didn't want to change because I liked my method and now I had to do a new one, but it's pretty easy. So no complaints. Thanks, John David Jones. All right, now I do, yep, go ahead. Oh, that's a good idea. So Mark said he puts a small dot. Well, you guys can read it's in the text, right, or chat. Yeah, that's a good idea. Mark the inside of the cap so you know where, where you want it. There's a lot of, of things you can do for that. Um, if you've ever seen a video where I assembled like a junior, I always do the body first so that I can line up the cap how I want, um, which you could essentially do this too. You could thread your body and then thread your cap short and just keep threading a little deeper until you get your alignment how you want it. And that's the, probably the easiest way, but just do it short so that you don't end up with like inch long threads. All right, this thing is so smooth, it's looking good. All right. Hey, if anybody is, uh, is in the Salt Lake or on the way from Phoenix to Salt Lake and you want a shop visit, let us know. We're going to be uh, traveling up there and we'd love to do a video or a live stream on Wednesday if we're near Salt Lake or somewhere on the way because we won't be here and it's something we'd like to do in the future anyway. So if anyone's up for that, let us know. Okay. So it looks pretty good. Boy, that thing is shiny. So I could probably be happy with not using any polish because this thing looks great, but since I did the cap, I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Just put a dot on. 
just that one little dot. Actually, I'm going to do two dots because I need to do the whole length of this long thing. And I always say it, but I, it's been pointed out to me that I, I say it and then I do it. Try not to wipe your, your blank with paper towel after you polish it because you'll scratch it. A lot of times I try to use the wet part of the paper towel when I do this. So there's polish on there right now. Holy cow. Can you guys see that? Ooh, that thing looks awesome. Here, let's do this. Is it focused? I mean, that came out pretty nice and shiny. I don't see any scratches, so I don't have to redo it. <clears throat> You'll see our cap is quite a bit larger because I turned that body down quite a bit. But that's a cool looking pin. See, and I got a flat side on the, the larger, but once I turned it down, that all went away. Maybe I should have shaped that just a little more, but it looks cool. All right, let's move on. We're looking good so far. What's that? Oh. So we got the section to do, my favorite part. It's only my least favorite part because I had bad luck in the beginning and it's always stuck with me that I didn't like, oh, I just dropped it. <laughs> Maybe the mandrel saved it. <laughs> so I dropped the section there, but it looks like I didn't break it. Generally, if you drop these, they'll crack the threads. Just a <laughs> rule of thumb. Um, so try not to drop them. Set it over here. I was telling Zach when he was down here, I have like 20 black sections made all the time because generally I'll break, I'll have a day where I just break a bunch of them and black seems to look good with most colors. So I'll just throw a black one in there and they're just spares. So, okay. One thing, so before I do this, it is hard to get the front of the section polished before, before turning it on the mandrel. So what I want to do, I want to put this actually in a collet. And I want to just sand and polish real quick the front of this. must be that one and it'll even though there's not going to be a lot of material left it'll be worth it because then it'll look good from the front to the back and if I don't do it it'll have a little bit of a dull spot which isn't great we did all this work we want it to look good but this will take just a few seconds because we're only doing a little spot and we're doing it so fast it's, well, here, I'm going to turn that down. But it's, it's so small, and we're right in the center of where the, the axis is here, the spindle, that it just spins so fast. So even going this slow, I'm removing a lot of material real quick. And it's worth it to take the time to do it. And here, you'll see... Um, I should have showed you before I sanded that, but this goes from kind of dull to super shiny really, really quickly. All right. What's the chatter going on, Amy? Anything? So I'm just kind of pushing in the hole because I'm just trying to get the edge. All this material is going to get turned away except for the inside like millimeter. So I don't really have to sand the whole thing, but I'm just kind of holding my finger in the hole and letting it sand or polish, whatever. Is that a good idea for you to use to apply the polish? 
Yeah, that's a great idea. Andrew said use t-shirt scraps for the polish. Um, soft cotton seems to be really nice. And if you cut it, it's usually pretty clean. There doesn't like have a lot of frays or strings getting wrapped around stuff. So that would work really well. There's probably far better choices than paper towel, but that's what I always have available. So that's what I always use. Even those blue shop towels are a little softer. All right, we're almost done with this, so this doesn't take long. This is our blue, this is our last one. The white on this is one micron, which is equivalent to like 20, I think they said 22 or 24,000 grit. So that's pretty fine. All right. So that looks pretty good. And you can see, even though it's wet a little bit here, like that is pretty shiny. Okay, let's turn this sucker. Snap it in. It's our little mandrel guy on there. And this is very small and fine. We're not using the tail stock for the section. Um, but you can see where this goes. That is almost the entire length of the body. Now you can see. So it's supported on that little little shaft there and you want to turn that up there nice and snug and we'll just put that there let's turn it down so with that like i was saying the small threads make sure you don't you know go in real aggressive and get a catch you want to nice make nice smooth cuts which i'm going to try to do um, i'm going to try to give it just a little bit of a concave profile concave or convex concave uh, just for like finger grip because this is where your finger goes when you're writing with this pen uh, and that should be good let's give her a try all right i'm gonna speed it up and i'm gonna just kind of go back and forth here to make it round first let's hit the cam back and turn on the suction oh, I blocked it seems to be pretty good So this is where the radius comes in nice. If you're trying to create that little bit of a dip, you can just kind of rock it back and forth. Well, that stuff really gets in there, doesn't it? Hey, Zach, what up? <laughs> All right, that you should be able to see the curvature. It's still way too big, but at least you see where I'm going for. So I can take these down quite a bit.
Now I don't want to overdo my back end here because I do want this to kind of line up to my threads. So let's take our body and just thread this on here carefully. I want that curve to kind of line up just in front of my, um, my thread. So I'm like right there, but probably need just a tiny bit more. Oh, try to unthread the whole thing. Well, I'm gonna have to undo this. My hands are too big to get in between there. Okay, there we go. Everything's kind of dry, so I don't want to I don't want to force it if it's not ready to come off. Okay. So we are very close. We need to come off this front a little bit and just a tiny bit off the back. And honestly, you probably could do that with uh sanding if you wanted to spend the time. I didn't turn the vacuum back on. Come on, get out of there. I gotta see what I'm doing. So I haven't been removing a lot of material from the back, but I was kind of tapering to the front and I got a nice little curve there. I think that's uh, what I want. I'm gonna go ahead and test fit this one more time. And actually just make sure I can see it. Mm, looks pretty close. Let's see if I can get that off of here. I think by the time I sand that, it's gonna be just right. So I'm gonna go ahead and leave that and we'll get this sanding and polishing. This is really coming out nicely. All right. So back down, slow her down a little bit. All right. <clears throat> so I think you can see, hopefully this has taken away some of the, the stigma of these custom pens. And I'll tell you, if you do this very often, it gets easier and easier. I actually haven't been making a lot or I hadn't been making a lot of custom stuff. So I was a little out of practice, but then a few months ago I started making more and, and it really comes back to you pretty quick. And then you can start having fun with accents and clips and you know rings and whatever else you wanna do. So it really makes it fun. So if you're, if you're gonna get into this, it's, it's definitely cool. If you're a blank maker, it's a great way to show off some of your blanks. Or if you have a favorite blank maker, there's, there's custom pen guys who make all the different custom blank maker stuff and it just looks so cool. All right, let's see if that is scratch free. Am I putting my head in the way or am I okay? So far so good? So far so good? Like I'm not putting my head in the way? Okay. All right, I actually I moved it, that's probably why. So this is, <clears throat> this is the third piece I did with this, this Zona. I am hitting the aluminum a little bit, so I probably won't use this for another pen. But this little one inch square has lasted really nicely for these and it's still, I can still see it's slurrying and removing material. But don't, don't get stuff just 
to get it, like if you already have something that works well, use it up and then you can always try something new when you need to restock. All right. Hey, while I'm doing the boring stuff here, is anybody gonna do the ornament contest? We got a huge ornament contest. And can I tell the secret? Did you already announce the thing? Okay, so um, I'm on a record power Regent lathe, but if you guys remember last year and all through COVID, I was on a Herald, which was one of my favorite lathes ever. Uh, record power gave us a Herald lathe to give away in the ornament contest. And all you have to do to be eligible to win it is enter. You don't have to win. You don't have to have the most amazing ornament. You just have to participate. And somebody's going to win a $1,000 lathe from Record Power. And that's going to be pretty awesome. So I don't know. I know if I wasn't working here and doing this, I would be entering in a heartbeat. But I don't know better odds than that to win a lathe. You know, even if there was 500 people, that's still great odds. But last year we had about 200, right? Or 150, something like that. So under 200. So make a lathe. It's for a good cause. It's for charity. Make a lathe. Make an ornament for charity. It's a good cause. And you have a chance to win an awesome prize. Yes. So... Normally I'll use 600 and 800 uh, and I use wet dry paper. Um, we sell wet dry paper, but you don't have to use ours, of course. But I will tell you this, get good wet dry paper. Don't buy it at Harbor Freight because the grit will fall off and it'll slurry up your water and it'll scratch your stuff. So get good paper like from an automotive shop or paint shop. Um, it's not very expensive. 600, 800 and then Zona. Now, I just went from 800 to Zona today because we're going a little speedier. Um, but if you're at all concerned, like you have any tool marks or out of round parts or not out of round, but like shape parts you want to work on, use the 600 first. It'll feel like it's super aggressive, even though it's 600. And it'll leave your stuff super shiny. The problem with these small parts is if you go too aggressive first, you're going to remove a lot of material. And you don't want to necessarily do that in all these cases. Okay, tell me how cool this looks. Can you talk about mandrel? Because we have to insert right? Yes. But they're different from the ones we were using. Yes. The question was, can I talk about mandrels? So right now we carry Beaufort mandrels from the UK. And um, we've tried to carry others. It's just a matter of keeping them come in regularly it's hard to do but Beaufort's been pretty good we have all of the cap mandrels from I think 11 or 12 up to 15 and that means cap and then the body would be the section size so uh, we have the m10 section body mandrel and we have the Bach nib mandrel so if you want to make a um Bach nib, you can get one of those. If you want to make a Yovo nib, which is what I'm making here, you have to make your own mandrel. Now, um, it's not that hard because you kind of saw the process of doing the inside of the section. That's the same process for the mandrel, only in reverse. So you measure the steps and then you turn it down, do the tap at the end. And I'm happy to send pictures of these, uh, or you can look at the Beaufort ones for Bach because they essentially will look the same. Uh, some people that make mandrels don't do the steps. They just have a straight rod to the threads, and that's it. And I guess that'll work fine. Um, I like to have that little step, at least the lip on the end, because that kind of keeps the, the section from moving side to side. And I'll show you here if I can get this camera zoomed in. Where are we at? So that little lip inside there is where that step is. So you see we got the polish all the way around the front and look at the, the polish on that thing. That is hard to beat. So mandrels, mandrels can cause you some headache in the beginning uh, if you can't get the exact ones you want. Hopefully everybody has friends in the pen world and you know if you know someone who has mandrels that they've made, 
reach out to them and see if they'll make you one. Um, we'll try to get some in stock ASAP on the Yovo side, but um, yeah, I'll see what I can do right away. But yeah, reach out to a friend. I remember when I first started this years and years ago, I'm trying to remember who it was. One of the guys, I think he's still around. I asked him about a mandrel and he made one and sent it to me for this tap and I used it for years. So, you know, if you, if you can make mandrels, pay it forward to somebody else uh, and I'll see what I can do as well. But yeah, good question. The Beaufort mandrels are good. They'll get you started. Um, one thing I will tell you, like here's a cap mandrel. Um, they're going to be just a certain length and, and size. And I think this one, it looks like maybe I tapered it down for some reason. I don't remember why, but they're not going to be the exact length that you're using in your pen. So they're going to get you started and they'll work fine, but you may down the road want to customize your mandrel to fit the inside of your cap just perfectly if you're step drilling or whatever you're doing. So this will be a great starting point. Um, be aware, sometimes the threads come a little dinged because they're coming from England and they just get banged up. But you have the tap and die, you can run it over and kind of chase your threads and clean them up uh, so that they function. But it won't take away from the function, it'll just look bad. Um, so just keep that in mind. But they do work well and they're made of brass, so they're tough. But lots to do with mandrels. We'll probably do a whole live stream on mandrels, don't you think, Amy? Sorry, yeah. We'll probably do a whole live stream on mandrels. I think that would be beneficial. What do you guys think? Do you want a live stream on mandrels in a few weeks? I'll have to get some materials together, but we can kind of go over how to make a couple different ones and see what, where it goes from there. But good questions. Let's jump over to the table and let's talk about this pen. All right, get this out of the way. I'm going to put down, my table is not the smoothest surface, but, oh, I got to come this way. There we go. There is our section, our cap and our body. And of course we need a nib. Now, if you didn't clean your parts beforehand, I would definitely clean the parts. I did throw these in the ultrasonic before we did it. Even so, there's going to be some debris in there, so it's probably a good idea to clean them after, but we're not going to sit here and wait for that. Um, I'm just going to show you the quick assembly of this. Now, I like to use this pure silicone grease because I don't like dry threads. And when I say do, don't use a lot, I mean like this, I've had this same jar for a couple years and I use it all the time, so I don't use much at all especially on these like little tiny threads. I'm just gonna put a little dab on it and I'm just spinning it around. And it's just to lube the threads. So then we can put our section, our nib in our section. And we got a converter. People are affirmative on the mandrels. Okay, everybody wants to do the mandrels. And then do a little more of this on your section threads. And hopefully you can see that little tiny dab is really all you need. Just spread it around. And before I put this in, I'm gonna put a little tiny bit on here. And this is something I'll put on my pens when I'm using them all the time, just to keep them smooth and moist. Now, if they get dirty, you can throw them in the ultrasonic because obviously any kind of lubrication can attract dirt, but typically your fountain pen isn't gonna be laying in the dirt, hopefully. Well, that's a lot of threads there. Put the cap on. And there you go. So hopefully we can see that. But that makes it nice and smooth, comes off pretty easy. Bring, oh, my section's a little tight. Yeah, a little snug. But it's a pretty good looking pen. So that's just one little thing I like to do with the silicone grease and it'll just make it a little easier on your threading and keep them a little more moist. You can do that on old pens too, refresh them up a little bit. All right. How's our questionnaireing going? Anything come up? What does everybody think? That, I mean, has anyone watched all four parts now? This is, well, this is the third part of the actual making, but um, like, was that pretty simple? 
Does it seem more difficult? Um, that I don't know. I'd have to look into it. The question was, where do you get the Bach? Wait, nib or did you say nib or tap? The die. The oh, box. the die. So we have the taps. Um, I'll see about getting a few dies. Well, honestly, I'd have to judge interest on if we want the Yovo or Bach dies because I think we have to buy them like 24 at a time, which is quite a lot if there isn't a lot of interest. But that would allow you to make um, sections, or not sections, but section mandrels. So if you're interested in that, like shoot us a message and just say, hey, I'd be interested in that. We can look around and see. If anyone knows who sells them, feel free to put it in the chat here, because I don't know. Um, oh, you know who might sell them? Mike at Silver Pen Parts used to have some of that stuff. I wonder if he still does. Does anybody know that? Silver Pen Parts? Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll look into that as well, because you would need the die to make the mandrel. That's a very good point. So that's where if somebody had one, they could help you out. But uh, if you've seen all four parts, what do you guys think of this? Is it pretty, pretty doable? I think this is a pretty good looking pen, and this is a very, very, very basic uh, way to make it. So this didn't take a lot of painstaking work and it came out pretty cool. Yeah. A lot of people watched all four. Okay. Yeah, so I'll try to get more info on the nib dies and see what we can do there. I would, I, I will order them if we, if we have enough demand, but that's just, it's a lot of pieces. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I hope this is kind of a motivator to try it. Like I said in the very first one when we went over tooling, use what you've got, especially the first time. Just try to figure something out that'll work. It might not be the best way to do it, but see what you've got, see what'll work, and just try it and see if it's something you wanna do. I would also recommend find a pen maker you like or a friend that makes them and see if you can get one. Buy one, trade one, whatever, that way you have something to look at and make measurements off of and kind of help you figure out the first time. Now we did give measurements throughout this series. Um, did you put those in the description as well? Measurements? Um, I think so, yeah. So uh, you can probably make this one based on the information we've given. Uh, if you have any questions, let me know. But it's a good idea to have something to kind of look at and go off of and it might help make things make sense if you haven't done this before but hopefully that's a, a good thing. So watch these series. Yes? Andrew asked, can you quickly explain the pen's inner workings nib converter cartridge? Yeah. So the question is, can we explain the inner workings, the nib converter and cartridge? So inside your pen, now we're talking fountain pen, you have the nib. I'm gonna go to the overhead here. So this is what is inside of your, your pen section. So this is the, the housing. There's a little nipple at the back here. This is a cartridge, I'm sorry, a converter. Converter is used to fill ink out of like a bottle or another source. So you can fill any type of ink or color. That presses onto that little nipple and then it feeds through the nib feed, which are these little ribbed parts. So you can see that. And then it flows out the tip of the nib. Now you'll either use a cartridge or a converter. A cartridge is simply a little plastic vessel about this size that is already filled with ink that you press on. And when you press it on, you're poking a hole in the front and that's when the ink starts to flow. So you either use one or the other, not both at the same time. However, most of these pen components like the the Bach and the Yovo nibs are compatible with either cartridge or converter. Now you want to get an international standard cartridge or converter. This is a Schmidt. This is what most people choose. Uh, really good converter. You can clean these. You can change color by just cleaning it out uh, with water or flush, putting it in your cleaner, whatever it takes. 
but you can switch ink whenever you want. The cool thing about that is you can pick the ink, whereas cartridges, you can only put in what is available. Now, there are a lot of cartridges available. We actually got the Conklin line in, and there's a bunch of cool colors in that. So you can, you can get cool colors in cartridges uh, and other stuff, but there's far more choices in bottles. And most people who get into fountain pens dig the bottles. They have like a bottle collection, it seems. It makes, you feel fancy. makes you feel fancy, Amy says. But that's how the insides work. So this is basically the functioning part of the pen right here, the nib the feed, the housing, which is all part of the nib that comes together, and then the cartridge or converter. So I hope that answers your question, but it's pretty, pretty easy actually. And you will get ink on your fingers, that's a given. So, yeah. All right, well, we'll give it a few seconds here because we have a little bit of a delay, but if there's no more questions, thanks everybody for watching. If you didn't watch the others, please go back and watch them. Give me a thumbs up on them so we know that they're valuable or useful and we should continue. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the channel so we can let you know when new stuff comes. Next week, we're going to do either a clip or a rollerball section. We'll figure that out. And Amy will post it and put up the uh, live stream thing. So if you have a preference, let me know, but we'll see what, what comes. We're going to do that. So we got at least those two to do, and then we're going to do a mandrel video. So that's coming up next or in the future. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good evening, and hopefully you can go make a pen now. Awkward silence. All right. Kill it.